Poke the Bear is brought to you by Price Picks and the Game Time app. And welcome into Poke the Bear, presented by Prize Picks. Go use that promo code CLNS for up to one hundred dollars cash back on that first deposit. And we're presented by Game Time. Go use that promo code CLNS to get twenty dollars off that first purchase. Terms apply. I'm Evan Marinovsky. That is Joe Haggerty. Hags, what is up? What's up, Evan? How you doing, my friend? I am good. I am good. You and I are filling in uh, for Connor, who is still on his uh, amazing honeymoon. It's, Where is he, by the way? I don't know. I, I was trying to click the link uh, to his location in his Instagram bio this morning. Parts and it wouldn't, alone. Yeah, parts. It wouldn't pop up. And I was like, I, you know, I can I can just text him. Uh, and he's somewhere for Connor Ryan and his lovely bread. Yes, uh, it's he's somewhere, you know, with, with animals. And he, I know he I, I got to say uh, he posted an Instagram story the other day of like a beach and he tagged like Nantasket Beach. And I didn't look. I was just a quick look. And I was like, oh, wow, he's already back. And then I saw the tweet. With the Nantasket Beach, uh, the Nantastic Beach photo, yeah, and I was like, "Oh, this is a really beautiful beach, like in uh, wherever you know Tanzania, or wherever the hell he is. This is not <laughs> Nantasket Beach." Um, but uh, he's having fun, and uh, we're here. We're here. Uh, we're we're holding it down stateside, grinding it out. Uh, we are. We are nose to the grindstone, hard at work uh, in August, um, and that's why we're here. And I want it. It's there's not a lot of new Bruins news to talk about, but you did write you wrote something interesting the other day for Boston Sports Journal, um, basically you know wondering if Arthur Kaliev could be an option for the Bruins um, this year. Yep. And basically, a little background on Arthur Kaliev uh, was an RFA for the Kings, has not got a contract yet, um, produced fairly well the last the two prior years to this past winter. Uh, this year had a really down year uh, for the Kings. Seems to be on the outs over there. Uh, Twenty three years old. Um, you kind of mentioned this could maybe be an option for them as sort of like a Danton Heinen signing, um, where you sort of get him at his, with his value at his absolute lowest. And maybe he fits in that top six. Do you think that's the route, uh, that they take or, or should take? I, I don't think they're going to take that route just because they're going to have to, you know, part of the reason he is going to get traded is because he's an RFA and he hasn't signed and he's gotten, He's put up decent enough numbers where he is going to command, you know, two to three million dollars, I would think, at the least. Um, so, like, you're not put it this way, you're not going to trade. And this is the kind of what the, what I sort of um, the, the resolution I came to and what I wrote was that you're not going to trade for somebody like that until you've signed Jeremy Swayman, like the, until they get cost certainty with Swayman and they know how much he's going to be. They're, they're not going to be spending any of the rest of their cap space, which they don't have a ton anymore um, after signing all those people on July 1. You know, they're not going to trade for a guy like Kaliev and back themselves, paint themselves into a corner where now they have to start making trades if they want to sign Swayman. So it would only happen after they get a contract for Swayman. And I don't know that there's going to be enough pie left um, to bring in a guy like Kaliev. And I also like he's been fine. Um with the Kings, but his numbers have declined. He had his worst NHL season last year. And, you know, to have declining numbers after you were like a scoring dynamo in um, junior and he dropped to the second round too, when he was a first round talent. I'm, and I'm not sure why that was. Mm -hmm. um, so there's like some warning signs there of like, maybe you don't want to bring this guy into the fold too. just like the sort of context clues. When you look at him as a player, I haven't really asked a ton about him uh, of people around the league, but I think just based on some of that stuff, you would say maybe that's not a guy you're going to cannonball into the pool to try to sign uh, at this point, especially I, I think honestly, um, I think at this point the Bruins have determined they want to look at Fabian Lysel. They want to look at potentially Merkulov, even though interestingly enough, and one of my listeners point, pointed this out, uh, Merkulov, uh, the guy, Mark Allred, I think you might know him, the black and gold. Uh, yes. He does all that yes. stuff. Really, really good guy, uh, very knowledgeable guy. But he pointed out to me and he asked this question on the Pucks with Hags podcast that um, uh, Merkulov has never played right wing at all ever even for a game he's always been you know center or left wing so are you going to plop him into a right wing spot at the nhl level uh without a trial period and you know my response to that was uh, he's going to have a trial period in training camp <laughs> if they need him at right wing and they want to get looks there the trial period is training camp that's the best trial period you could possibly have if you're trying somebody in a new spot and 
Um, Don Sweeney mentioned by name guys like Lysel, Merkulov, and uh, Riley Duran were the three names he mentioned when you talked about a wing spot being open or young guys kind of pushing for NHL gigs. So I would expect all three of them to be in the mix uh, when they're looking at people in training camp. And I think also, you know, you throw bones to Morgan Geeky, Trent Frederick, uh, Justin Brzeau, um, Max Jones, like guys like that too. I think I think the Bruins want to get looks at all these people uh, in top six roles and see if any of them can really flourish or pop uh, in that role. But I would suspect that Lysel is the guy they really want to win the job, just based on where he is as a pro, the year he had in the AHL. Like he was a former first round pick. They've drafted and developed and invested in this guy. And it's kind of, as Bruce Cassidy used to say, the circle of life, hockey and in pro hockey, that when a guy like Jake DeBrusque moves on and you can't afford him anymore, it's the circle of life in the NHL is your prospect that you drafted that's the right wing prospect comes up and takes that job or hopefully he does. And if, if the Lion King circle of life continues to go for the Bruins, Lysel, I think would be the guy that would end up, you know, taking that spot um, that Jake DeBrusque is vacated. But I think the Bruins want to look at their in-house options before they start chasing down guys like Kaliev. That's yeah, my, I agree. No, I agree with you. And I think Kaliev is an interesting case, um, but you're right. I think there is, and when you have guys like Lysel, Mark Yuloff, um, in house, mainly Lysel, that's who you want to see there. Um, you don't want to, you don't need to bring in another option like a Cali. Now, I guess if Lysel wasn't there and Mark Yuloff wasn't there and Duran and they had nobody young who could potentially play in the top six and it was just Frederick, geeky guys they currently have that are established, then yeah, I, I can see why you might want to bring in a Cali of, um, to, you know, a younger guy to try that out, but they don't need that. They don't have that. Um, but an interesting thing you wrote is uh, the more sensible solution is signing uh, signing a vet, potentially like a Kyler Yamamoto or a Blake Wheeler. And then Wheeler yep. was a guy that Bruins fans kind of wanted to see brought in last year, um, given his and, history. And, with and Strong was on that list too, by the way, until he signed with the Vancouver Canucks. He was another one that was kind of in that bargain basement bin, even though uh, not very good defensively, but a good offensive winger. So there was a there was. A bunch of players. Wheeler and, and uh, Yamamoto were just examples, but there's a yes. handful of players that are in that category that would make good camp invites. So so when I look at this line, when I look at the Bruins roster is currently constructed uh, with what they have, you know, we've talked a lot about this. The bottom six seems pretty full with guys. Uh, you do have uh, guys coming up from uh, Providence, guys like Lysel, Merkulov, even Duran, who could take spots at the NHL level. Do you think the Bruins will go out and sign a vet minimum guy just to be safe? Do they need to do that? What do you think? Yeah. No, I definitely think they will. Uh, They did it last year. I think they're going to do it every year. It's good business to do it. Like if you can get a guy um, on a camp invite that might be good enough to be on your roster and you're going to end up signing them for 775K um, when it comes down to it, because that's if a guy is a camp invite, he's a guy that didn't get a guaranteed contract anywhere. So he's basically going to be playing for the league minimum because he's at your mercy uh, if he wants to play in the NHL. That's what happened with Danton Heinen last year. They end up getting great value, a player that had an outstanding season for them, played top six, like, but at the end of the year was playing with Pasternak and Pavel Zaka. Um, and they, they paid next to nothing for him. I, I think it's just good business to invite guys like that to camp, especially if you have an open spot. Last year, it was not just Danton Heinen. They had Alex Chasen, former BU player, um, in camp on a camp invite as well. And both of them were kind of duking it out to see if either one could win a spot. So they invited multiple guys. I would expect they're going to do the same thing this year. Why not? It's, it's no cost to, to you. And basically, um, it's going to be attractive to a lot of NHL veterans because they're going to see that there's a top six spot up for grabs. And that's what they're looking for in these training camp invites is they want to look at a roster and say, I might be able to win that spot. Like that's something that could be, you know, something if I'm good enough where I could seize it. Um, So I would expect uh, at least a couple of those uh, guys that have not gotten contracts that are viable NHL veterans like a a Kyle Yamamoto, like a Blake Wheeler, um, J- JVR, I don't think is going to get that kind of an invite from the Bruins. Why would he come back if they didn't want him on, a, on an actual contract? That wouldn't make sense for him. But he's another player that was in that list of guys uh, that may get a training camp invite. Um, so it's that kind of player. It's either a young player like Yamamoto that, you know, for whatever reason they didn't tender, uh, didn't qualify and want to pay the money to keep him. Or an older guy that, that just didn't get a contract like a Wheeler or a JVR. I, I think those kind of guys make sense 
to just bring it on a flyer in training camp and take a look at them and have them compete with everybody else. Because best case scenario, you get an NHL player that's going to be productive and good for you for $775,000 cap it, which is exactly the kind of player you want if you're the Boston Bruins that could give you a lot of bang for the buck. And I think, you know, when we were talking earlier in the offseason, um, there was a lot of mention, or I think Fluto reported that the Bruins were kind of working to try to re-sign Danton Heinen. And I think the, yes. the vast reaction to it was, go find the next one. You yes. know, go, let him go get his money. Don't be the team that that gives into that. Go find the next Danton Heinen. And I think, like, I, yeah. I don't know Yamamoto's game well. Um, I just know he's young. I know he struggled. Um, and there were high hopes for a guy like him up in Edmonton. I know he struggled in Seattle last year uh, as well. And I wonder if, you know, if no one else takes a bite at that, what do you, what do you have to lose? Right. From a training camp uh, trial perspective, that's why I like that. Um, Wheeler's a fun story, obviously. You know, used to be here, uh, yep. older veteran guy. Uh, played in the top six for many, many years. Still looking for a cup. He's that guy. Yes, that, that's, that's right. Still looking for a cup. Still looking for a cup. You know, maybe that works. But yep. um, I like that Yamamoto's a little young. I like that. Um, you know, if they want to, if they want to give that a shot, you know, I'm okay with trying it for a camp tryout. Like, yeah, to lose. Well, I, I think with Yamamoto, he's got a lot going for him. He's young. He's fast. He's skilled. He's a little feisty. Like, he's got a little bit of feistiness to his game. He's really small. Like, that's one of the problems with him is he's very, very small by NHL standards. So he's going to have to, you know, play up, play fast, play feisty, be that guy. You know, have those attributes that guys that are like 5'8", five, 5'7", five, have that are able to stay in the league and survive. Um and, you know, I, I think he at, in Edmonton, when he was playing with real high level talents for the team that invested a first round pick in him, um, he was doing pretty well. Uh, but, you know, once he got to, I think, another team where there wasn't enough allegiance uh, there and not enough invested draft and development wise, it wasn't quite the same uh, same thing. But like, I think if you're going to do a camp invite, I, I would I, I think the best of both worlds is like invite a guy like that that's young, that, you know, maybe just wasn't a great fit organizationally um, in Seattle uh, at his last stop. And the Bruins have done this with guys like Brazo, guys like Weatherspoon, like taking guys from other organizations that weren't a great fit there and found a, a home for them here. Maybe they can do something like that for Yamamoto. So bring a guy like that in on a training camp invite and also bring a guy like Wheeler in. Um, that's an older veteran kind of uh, type that might have the savvy and and enough left in the tank, especially to play in a a plum role with Charlie Coyle and Brad Marchand. I mean, what would be better than placing some established veteran in in a role like that? You know, if if they were up for it and they could do it, um, why wouldn't they want to play in that kind of role? That's exactly what those veteran guys are looking for: is being able to play in that kind of a spot where it's gonna you know, be less wear and tear on them, be less expectation. You're talking about a guy in Blake Wheeler that was the captain in Winnipeg for a long time, tons of pressure on him, went to the Rangers last year, got hurt, um, had a decent year, came back at the very end, but like was fine. Um, but I think still has a little bit left in the tank at this yeah. point. You can put him into a good spot where he's not having too much on his shoulders and you're not putting too many minutes and too many responsibilities on him. Like something like the Bruins would make a ton of sense, I think. And it seems like he wants to play in the East, too. When he got to choose where he was going, he went to the New York Rangers. So maybe he wants to stick around uh, in some kind of Eastern Conference place. Yeah, Wheeler makes sense. Um, I like that idea, and I like uh, Yamoto. Again, it goes back to what you said. It's it, they're, um, they're, What is there to lose? Again, like if you're getting a guy like that on a veteran minimum, or a veteran minimum deal. Uh, Low risk, high reward is always a good way to go, Evan. That's what you got to do. Let me say one thing uh, before we uh, j- jump back into this, Evan. Let me give... A congratulations um, to former Boston Bruins employee Michael Penhollow. Uh, did all the video stuff, did a ton of like the TV stuff behind the scenes uh, with them and just left the Bruins at the end of last season. Uh, I don't know if you saw this or not, but on Swayman's Instagram, there was pictures of him hugging Linus Allmark and um, uh, Hampus Lindholm at a uh, at a wedding in Italy. And it was Michael Penhollow's wedding in Italy. Um, it was a picture of like, um, I just saw, I just opened Instagram to see this. <laughs> yeah. 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 So there it's a picturesque wedding in Italy. It's Michael Penn Hall as Penner as he's known around, uh, Bruin circles. It was his wedding, uh, this, this past weekend or this past week, uh, in Italy and a bunch of the Bruins were there. Uh, Travis, I think is in one of the pictures, Travis from the Bruins as well. So, um, 
Congratulations to Michael Penhall for getting married. Congratulations to him and his wife. Uh, looks like it was a fantastic wedding ceremony. Star studded, obviously, with the go- two goalies hugging and with Hampus Lindholm there as well. But that's a credit to you know the kind of uh, person that Penner is and the kind of employee he was with the Bruins that a bunch of the players want to go to his wedding. I agree. Uh, congratulations to him. Sad to see him go. Incredible yep. video. I mean, like that Instagram is so fun to look at. Um, does a f- fantastic job. Uh, with behind the B and and a lot of their um, a lot of their different uh, media that they put out, and so it'll be it's unfortunate to see him go, but uh, yep. congratulations to him. That's it. it. Looks like a hell of a wedding. I just went through the photos on Dude. Instagram and I went through his story. Woo! That Getting was- married in Italy is no joke. That's that's yeah. like going for it right there. I, it's funny. I saw a TikTok recently about I don't know if it was it might have been Italy. It was like a wedding in Italy, and and they put the price at the end of it, and it was a lot, but it wasn't like a ton so no. it's like oh, maybe it's maybe it's doable maybe I, it's- destination <laughs> here's a, a, a and i yeah, agree with you a hack uh destination weddings are the way to go like the price you actually spend less to get married somewhere picturesque like i got married in the bahamas it was less than we would have paid in the u.s for a wedding like significantly less and it also was a smaller wedding too which was always nice like the people i think i mentioned this to you the people that are there are people that really want to be there and the people you really want to be there like the the, the, you know, peripheral sort of riffraff people that like they just get invited because like you end up with a 300 person uh, wedding. Uh, you don't do that for the destination wedding. It's a much smaller uh, group, which I think is better. Um, but the, the price part is like you can't be denied, like much cheaper to get married elsewhere uh, or at least a bit cheaper to get married elsewhere than to like get married in the U.S. Where as soon as people hear wedding, they jack up the prices on everything and you pay a ton. I agree with you. I mean, I haven't gone through it, but like, I would much rather have uh, a fun, like destination style, beautiful place wedding, like in Italy or the Bahamas or wherever with, but the biggest draw is I want just the people I really, really, really like. I don't, you know, there's a lot of people that I kind of like, a lot of acquaintances. I want my core. I want my group. I want and you fun like you have to invite them to your wedding. It's like it's one of those things where like you all of a sudden like are like, all right, I've, we've got to invite. If we invite this person, we got to invite this person. If we do that, like when you do the destination wedding, and all of a sudden it's a little more expense for them people to have to come. And you want to oh, keep. Oh, the, oh sorry. Oh, yes. yeah. Sorry you want to keep them clean too, as far as who you're inviting. Like that's the way to go. Yeah. No, it's a uh, it's an interesting thought. I've got a little while, so I'll I'll, I'll mull that over. <laughs> Yeah, at Connor's wedding though, um, I, who was it? I think it was uh, Matt Porter's wife, who's really nice, uh, really nice lady. Um, yep. She, uh, when my girlfriend got up to go to the bathroom, she was like, "So are you gonna marry her? Are, are you gonna marry her?" <laughs> Matt was like, "Stop it! All right, stop it!" I was like, yeah. How old are you? I'm 25. Oh, dude, yeah, you got time, man. You do do not be in a hurry. Do not be in a hurry. I agree with you. I'd give it, I'd, I would not, I, if I were to give a recommendation to you, like at, uh, I'm going to be 50 uh, this month. Um, and I've been married for, God, how long have I been married? I've been married for uh, 13 years, I think now. Is that right? Wait a minute. Let me think. It's 2004. Well, yeah. Something like that. Like 14 years. I'd have to, uh, it's 13, 14 years now. We're coming up on 15. I would highly highly recommend to you that you do not get married or have kids at least before 30 maybe even 35 but like live your life in your 20s because once you have kids once you get married it in any way shape or form will never be about you again like (laughs) your, your time of being the center of your own universe is over as soon as you get married and start having kids and the, the further you get into fatherhood, you realize that like you, you're, you know, you're going to be like carrying the thing. You're going to be like doing a ton of stuff. You're going to get like zero credit for anything that you're doing. And it's never going to be about you. And that you know, you're totally fine with it because you just want to see everybody like happy, living life, loving, doing well. You know, and you, the fact that everybody's happy, healthy and, ha- and, and having a good time is like all the reward you need. But it's never, ever going to be about you again once you get married. So, like, have all your fun when you're in your 20s and uh, all your glory that you want to have now because, like, it changes once you get married and you have kids. 
You're telling me you don't go out every Friday, Saturday night, wake up at like 11 a.m. on Sunday morning. You don't you don't get to do that now. That's not. I have to ask permission months ahead of time just to go golfing on a Monday on a day in the summertime with my buddies and maybe maybe stay overnight at a hotel on Sunday night in New Hampshire before we go golfing on Monday. Maybe. Maybe. So Yeah, maybe. And that's I'm talking. Once, once during the summer, Evan. <laughs> <laughs> one, okay. time. It's one time. You, you may see your buddies two or three times during the summer. Maybe. Maybe. That's hilarious. Yeah. Well, someday. Someday, <laughs> heck. That's someday. right. That's what you have to look forward now, to. Some now, for now, I'm going to enjoy being the center of my own universe. Center yes. of the entire universe. That's yes. Me for a little bit longer. The star um, of your movie, Evan Marinowski. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Uh, at some point, I'm going to get sick of that movie, though. <laughs> this, is, this, is, this is bad. Um, anyways, uh, I, I want to talk about Jim Montgomery's future. Um, yeah. Ty Anderson and I, uh, I think it was on Poke the Bear last week, uh, kind of mentioned this at the end. And then we really got into it. I kind of just threw this in at like the 41-minute mark. Just like, oh, you know, we should talk about this a little bit. Um, maybe save it. And he, Ty just went in on Jim Montgomery's future and what he thought about it. Um, I want to get to that in a second, uh, but first, quick word from our friends over at Game Time. The Celtics are champs, the Bruins are hibernating, and Patriots training camp is still months away. But it's the summer, and the Red Sox are heating up at just the right time. And if you're a Sox fan and want to catch a game at Fenway, you got to go with Game Time Tickets. Game Time is an authorized ticket marketplace that makes getting MLB tickets even faster and easier. Prices on the Game Time app actually go down the closer you get to first pitch. With killer last-minute deals, all-in prices, views from your seat, and their lowest price guarantee, Game Time takes the guesswork out of buying MLB tickets. And the best part about Game Time tickets? You can browse through the Game Time app to find great seats at affordable prices for all sorts of in-demand games, concerts, and other events. Want to snag last-minute tickets to a concert? Game Time tickets has you covered. Maybe a Sunday matinee game at Fenway, or maybe even an early ticket to Gillette in September. There's no shortage of options when using the Game Time app. Some of my favorite features of the app include seat views, where you can get a panoramic view from your seat in the app before you buy, and the lowest price guarantee, or else Game Time will credit you 110% of the difference. You also can't beat all-in pricing, a feature that shows you the total of your tickets up front, with no surprise fees waiting for you at checkout. Game Time Tickets also has you covered with the most flexible customer service policy in the ticketing industry, including event cancellation protection, 24-hour return guarantee, job loss assurance, and on-time ticket delivery. So what are you waiting for? Did the guests work out of buying MLB tickets with Game Time? Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use code CLNS for $20 off your first purchase. Terms apply. Again, create an account and redeem code CLNS for $20 off. Download Game Time today. Last-minute tickets, lowest price, guaranteed. Now, let's get back to the show. So uh, Jim Montgomery is headed into the last year of that uh, for that three year deal he signed uh, yep. back in the summer yep. of 2022. And uh, we still don't really have word on an extension. There has not been any announcement of it. Um, yep. And one thing Ty and I were talking about was what would it take for him to get that extension? And, you know, you, you and I have kind of mentioned this before. Um, Montgomery has had no shortage of regular season success. Obviously the great year in 2022, 23 last year overachieved in 23, 24. Um, the playoff success though has been the complete opposite, right? That first year was a complete dud, um, you know, losing that three, one, uh, series lead to Florida in that first round. Then uh, last year, almost blowing it to Toronto. And then, you know, just, you know, put up a good fight against the Panthers, but losing in six, um, does he get an extension before the season? You know, does it come later in the season? Cause as I said to Ty, like lame duck coaches, you know, that's not something the Bruins always do. And yeah you know, having a coach be a lame duck can be a little bit of a dangerous game. Uh, what do you, what do you, what do you see happening? Well, I, usually when you allow a coach to enter a lame duck season, that's usually a sign that there's going to be the change, a change is a coming, you know, that's yeah. usually a sign that like maybe they plan on at some opportune time during the year, uh, changing coaches. Um, you know, that's uh, what happened. Uh, I believe that's what happened to Claude, I want to say, as I think he didn't get an extension. I think he was in the last year of his contract when he ended up getting replaced with Bruce Cassidy. And kind of the writing was on the wall, I think, a little bit um, as to what was going to happen. Um, 
I'm curious, what was Ty's take on this whole thing? Because I have not, uh, I've not talked to him about it. What did, what did he have to say? Ty's take was that uh, basically he did. This was like last week, and I was in the Cape last couple of days, so I forgot about it. But basically, his take was uh, he's he's no, you know, I don't know. He basically Ty was saying he doesn't know if he's the right guy. I think he thinks the Bruins don't know if he's the right guy either, given yep. the issues with playoff uh, success. And he wants yeah. to see Montgomery change things more during the playoffs, become more of a shot volume team. Uh, and I mentioned this, like, you know, with the way, with, with the way the raw, a higher shot volume team, because with the yeah, way yeah, the yeah. Roster is, um, you know, but guys mentioned he was, and they wanted to get away from that. Like, I, I, I know, but you know, this roster, I don't know if this roster is skilled enough to like, I love high danger chances more than anybody else, but yeah, I don't, you know, when I look at the line charts of this, you know, upcoming season and even look at last year, yeah, uh, they need to get more pucks on that. I don't know if they're skilled enough to get 19 shots and score five goals. No, no, no. I, yeah. The puck possession needs to be better. Not necessarily shots on net, but the puck possession definitely needs to be better. Um, yes. Yes. But there's also like counter arguments. Like, <clears throat> uh, hasn't Pasternak had his best offensive seasons of his NHL career under Jim Montgomery? Um, sure. You know, like, <clears throat> I think, I think that there are definitely. You're right. The regular seasons have been outstanding. Um, the especially last year, I thought was his best coaching job. Like at times, yeah. he had to, you know pull the reins harder. He had to really um, coach a little more, you know, like call out the team at times, like make some certain moves to motivate players, um, you know, call them out occasionally if they um, had deserved it. I, I thought he was better in the playoffs. Like he got out of the first round this year and I thought kind of got over the hump a little bit by winning that Toronto series, uh, both he and Pasternak. Uh, that was big for both of them, uh, that first round series win over to, to Toronto. And I think you also have to temper it with that um, they lost both years to the team from the East that made it to the Stanley Cup Finals. One year they lost in the Stanley Cup Final in a very entertaining, pretty good series where I think they were just too beat up in the end to, to actually win it. And last year they won it. Um, so, like, is it a dud when you lose in seven games – to a team that rolled through everybody else and got to the Eastern Conference Final, it maybe it is on some level when you're as talented as the Bruins were that roster that they had. But I think the way that Florida played after the fact and the way they've played for two years now shows you that it wasn't that much of a dud. They just lost to a better team. Um, in, you mean in 2023? Yeah, I, I Florida rolled through everybody and got to the Stanley Cup Final. I think they proved that they were the better team. Um, and that they've been the best team in the East the last two years. Like, I don't think there's any question that the Panthers have been the best team in the East the last couple of years. Um, and now having watched the full, like what they did in the playoffs, what they did during the regular season, the, the roster of players that they had, like they were the best team. Like it's clear. Um, and, I, but I do think, I do think there's a little bit of a change with Jim Montgomery when it comes to the playoffs. I don't think he necessarily out coaches the other teams that he's coaching against. I think he gets outmaneuvered a bit by other teams. I think there was definitely disappointment by the Bruins from the Bruins end that they weren't even able to push it to seven games this time around against Florida this year with the group that they had. Like, I also think you've got to like give Montgomery some credit where he got the most he could out of a team that was strapped salary cap wise and wasn't as talented, I think, as they were the year before. Uh, I think he did a really good job coaching this past year. And I think he was pretty good coaching in the playoffs too. You know, like, I don't think, I think there's things you can look at and have problems with as far as like putting players in the lineup, taking players out, like, you know, some of the lineup choices he made during the playoffs uh, more so two years ago than this year. I had bigger issues with not going with Swayman earlier uh, or at any point in that playoff series uh, with Florida before game seven, some of the, you know, players they were bringing in and out. Um, some of the stuff they did in the, I think it was the first round series I had issues with too, um, changing the lineup and putting certain players in and out. But like all that being said, I think he, he put it this way. Jim Montgomery should probably feel at this point like he's done enough to get an extension, right? Like, what more do I have to do? 
I've, you know, been, I've been, I won the Jack Adams. I've like had two magnificent regular seasons. I survived the retirement of Patrice Bergeron and David Krejci with a cap strap team last year and really sort of maximized what they got. Probably gave them the best battle of anybody aside from Edmonton in the playoffs this past year in that first yeah. round series. Like, have I not shown enough to deserve like an extension from the Bruins? Um, going into this season. So if I were Montgomery, I wouldn't be too happy about going into the season with a lame duck. I would think a uh, situation, I would think that I've earned at least an extension of a year or two to continue to see what we can do here. And we, we haven't even mentioned the too many men on the ice penalties, which was like a sign to me that there was some chaos going on on the bench. And then maybe he was like over coaching with like the lineup changes with the matchups, with all the stuff he was trying to do in the playoffs as well. I think that speaks to him, like uh, not having a full grasp of every, and his co- coaching staff, not having a full grasp of what was going on and not being able to like make quick decisions or have everybody on the same page. Like that's a reflection on him, whether he wants to blame it on the players or anybody else. And maybe that's part of it too. Um, but like, there are some th- things you can point at and say, Hey, this could have been better. This should have been better. Like he hasn't really proven himself to be this great playoff coach like he is during the regular season. But like, I, I don't know. I, I would, it's going to be an interesting situation if he goes into the year without a contract extension. And this isn't something that's done in training camp uh, because that's going to start opening up a lot of questions, especially with a guy on the staff now um, in Leach, who was a candidate for the Bruins head coaching job when Jim Montgomery got hired like you think that adds another Jay Leach being there that adds another dynamic as well to this whole situation because you do remember um, that Bruce Cassidy was added to the staff in Boston Claude Julian's last year when he yep. ended up getting fired and Bruce Cassidy took over the job so there is a uh, past practice of the Bruins doing um, you know doing this with an eye towards potentially making a move during the regular season so I think that's going to be interesting I also think. And Claude had trouble with this too during the year. Like if the coach knows that like his days are numbered or if like potentially there's a move coming during the season, it adds, it ratchets up the stress level so high. And I think that's going to be something really difficult for Jim Montgomery to deal with. If that's the case. It, it, w- it will. And, and, you know, maybe he gets an extension in September and it's like, Oh, well, we got his extension. Um, right. But you know, as I've said before, like, are they waiting to see what he does in the playoffs? Like, are they waiting to, you know, you're going to hand him an extension uh, you know, next May. Oh, I don't uh, think so. or, or June. Like, no, I think that's that's ridiculous. And it's crazy to think you can do that. And I think Montgomery would be pissed off enough by then. Like, would both sides even want to go to the negotiating table? Right. Um, that's the case. I don't think that's feasible. So, you know, I, I I they have expectations this year. They have real expectations this year. They went out, they signed Lindholm, they spent a lot of money on him. They signed Zadora, they spent a lot of money on him. Um, they are cup contenders. We've talked about this. Like they, you know, does does Montgomery get an extension in January when they're clearly in first place in the Atlantic, or is he canned if they are, you know, third place wild card team uh, right. in January or February? And so, um, I agree with you. I think he's, I think up to this point, he's done enough to probably warrant one on paper. Um, I disagree with you on the Panthers twenty twenty three thing. Obviously, in hindsight, they were the better team, no doubt. But when the Bruins were up 3-1, they just could not put them away. Like yep. that, you had a chance to put them away and you couldn't. Yep. Um, and that's to me where that's a big blemish on not just Montgomery, obviously, but the whole team's uh record and 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 sort of playoff uh success. So yeah, I you know, I I I think there are questions about him in the postseason, but um I, I thought, you know, regular season wise this past year, he was terrific. I thought, you know, he did well enough against Toronto. Um, you know held up in game seven. Obviously Bruins did get a little lucky that, um, that Joseph wall could not go in that game seven and they went up against him. So enough, but still they, yeah, they, they won, they won the game. You need luck uh, in a win playoff series. That's a part you of do. it. Yep. You do. Um, so I don't know. And, and I think this hint, it's at another thing with NHL coaching that I've never been a fan of. And, you know, um, coaches don't last long. Teams are very quick to, to pull the plug. I mean, John Cooper, Mike Sullivan, those guys are, you know, the anomalies that does not normally happen where guys stay forever yep. um, in one spot. And you even see we got Mike Sullivan on the hot seat this past year and in this coming season. And, you know, I, sometimes I think you need a little time 
you need more time and there isn't time in professional sports. That's the thing. It's, this isn't college uh, where you, you know, you have a new team every year voices, you know, um, vo- guys tune voices out. Um, but I do wonder if the Bruins say, you know what? He's given us enough success. Let's extend him uh, and hope this gets better. Or if they just say, you know what? This isn't working. Um, we're going to find someone who can push us over the hump in the playoffs and get this team to win, uh, you know, and maybe Montgomery can do that this year, but, like you can't wait around for that extension in May or June. Like no. that's just impossible. So I'm curious to see what they do. I am curious to see what they do. And if the Bruins are, I don't know, let's say they're eight and eight to start the year. Is he out? That's what I mean. Like it, 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 that's where I'm talking about the, the stress level ratcheting up because of the situation. Like if he doesn't have an extension, if they hit the skids, it's going to turn into questions about that. And and once it turns into that, it's going to be really hard to not have that in the back of everybody's minds. Like what if there's some players that don't necessarily like their role or disagree with Jim Montgomery and how he's using them? Do they all of a sudden, you know, start like saying, Oh, he doesn't have an extension. Like, you know, I can just wait this out and, you know, wait for them to make a move if we're not playing well, like, you, you know, that, especially if it's a player that's got, contract certainty more than Jim Montgomery does like these that's why these situations turn into um sort of runaway freight trains sometimes um if you leave it and you let this happen which you know I, I'm not sure they're going to give him an extension in training camp if they haven't done it over the summer maybe they will um and and like I said, if I were him, I'd want an extension based on what I'd been able to do the first couple of years. But um, I think it opens up to a lot of different scenarios happening that wouldn't be a possibility if he had a contract certainty. Like even though the Penguins struggled last year, um, Mike Sullivan signed until like friggin' 2030 or whatever it is. So like, you know, even yeah. it, 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 there wasn't really any realistic scenario where they're going to fire Mike Sullivan and pay him for the next four years, not to coach. Like, I think that's what the sort of trepidation is from the Bruins side is that Don Sweeney and Cam Neely would then have to go to uh, the Jacobs and say, you know, if they signed Montgomery to an extension, realize he wasn't the right guy and then had to fire him. They're going to have to explain to Jacobs why they're paying somebody like a million bucks a year to not do anything to sit home uh, in Montreal or wherever he's going to be and, and not coach, not do anything, you know, like not, not pay him to not coach anybody else and not coach the Bruins. I I think Jake, I think Jeremy Jacobs really doesn't like that situation when he has to pay somebody to not perform. Um, so I think that's something they're really looking to avoid. And that's part of the reason that they're they're in the situation that they're in. But, you know, I, I have a lot of respect for Jim Montgomery. I think he does a good job. I think he can be a little bit, a little bit too player friendly sometimes a little too, you know, but I think he's also last year. I think he changed that a little bit. I think last year there was a little more with Patrice Bergeron gone. I think there was a little bit more of him being firm and stern in certain situations, a little bit more of him sort of calling players out or using playing time as, as a motivator and, and him like if he didn't like something really like calling uh, the team out and, you know, he, he bag skated them twice during the year. And we didn't see that. I don't remember ever seeing that under Bruce Cassidy and maybe once or twice under Claude Julian. But the fact that he started doing some of that stuff, I thought was very interesting too. Um, And spoke to me of a coach that was like, you know, trying to change his tone a little bit and trying to change what he was doing. And I think learned from his first year. And I think that's kind of like one of the things that we have to like, and the Bruins have to take into account is that, you know, just like players, coaches are learning too. And Montgomery, like coaching in the pros and coaching at the NHL level is much different than coaching college, coaching junior, some of the other places that he had coached. So like when you put together his time and experience in Dallas being a head coach, then going to St. Louis being an assistant coach, then coming here to Boston and adjusting, like I think you've got to like allow for some of the development for him as a coach too and for him to sort of learn lessons from year to year. And I think he showed in year two that he learned a lot from year one and he applied it. And I, and I think for those reasons and for like what he's done, like I wouldn't have an issue if the, the Bruins extended Jim Montgomery. I think he's done enough and he should feel like he's done enough to earn it at this point uh, and to merit it. And if he doesn't get it, like, you know, 
there's a lot of pressure on him and it creates a really like interesting situation going into the year that could go a lot of different directions. I agree. I agree. It's going to be interesting to see whatever happens with that. Uh, Hags, what can people look forward to from you over pucks with Hags uh, and uh, PSJ? The Boston Sports Journal. Uh, they can look forward to. I just wrote um, yesterday. I think it was just a top ten prospect ranking uh, list um, based up to date now after development camp. Um, you know, Fabian Lysel at the top. Uh, Merkulov was in there. Brandon Bussey. Uh, Jelvik was very high up. I thought he was very impressive at development camp. Um, Gron- Elliot Gronwald made the list too. Uh, hey, there. there we go. Vermont kid uh, going to Qu- Quinnipiac. I thought he was awesome at development. Camp. I thought he was very good, like very solid, very skilled, good size. Like for a kid that's that young to show up like he did and and flash at times like he did, I thought was very impressive. Um, so you can go check out that list, uh, the prospect list. And, and in general, just that, you know, the Bruins continue to churn out NHL players and develop them from their system that they're drafting and developing um, so like maybe the draft Nick prospect gurus out there at the athletic and other places should actually start putting some respect on the Bruins name more than they have, especially after last year, after Mason Lowry, Johnny Beecher, um, and, uh, and who was the other one? Who am I missing? Johnny Beecher. What? I, I know. I was saying, shoot, like who is, oh, Matt Potts. Matt Potts. Yes. After the three of them graduated last year, um, to the NHL level, I, I think, those those kinds of people need to start viewing the Bruins in a little bit of a different light and then putting a little more respect in the scouting and drafting and development that the Bruins are doing because doing that while not having a ton of first round picks but churning out talent like that, like there's talent there. You know, they don't have a, like a superstar in their system, but they've got talented players. And I think that, uh, you know, some of these, the gurus and the draft Knicks need to like wake up and actually see what's going on out there. Elliot Greenwell, by the way, the latest uh, cover of New England Hockey Journal. Oh, there you go. Look at that. A little plug for the New England Hockey Journal, too. Of course. Yeah, he was the cover. We don't typically do a lot of Bruins, but local kid gets drafted by uh, his favorite hometown team. So Yeah, big Bruins fan, cool. Elliot Greenwell. He was pumped. He was a, yeah, that was a layup of a cover to do. Um, so, uh, yeah, it was uh, – I have to go – people should go check that out. And uh, that's been Poke the Bear. That's Joe Haggerty, Evan Marinovsky. You Poke the Bear listeners have a great rest of your week.